And we must now move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment. And I call Mr Roy Begg. Question number one. When the provisional information on municipal waste for the October to December quarter of 2014 was published back in April, I welcomed the fact that the tonnage of recycled household materials, excluding composting, had increased by more than 16,000 tonnes, over 3.5 per cent, compared with the same October to December period of the previous year. However, whilst the total tonnage of household materials sent for recycling increased, the rate of recycling decreased slightly by 0.3% to 38.6%, mainly because of the even faster growth in the total amount of waste collected by councils. But it is important to put this into context. Over the last five years, the recycling rate across all councils has increased in spite of significant challenges, and over the last decade, the annual recycling rate has increased fourfold to 41.3% in 2013-14, the most recent validated figure. Year-on-year -year improvements in the recycling rate have been increasingly more difficult to achieve, and this is because of a number of factors such as poor financial return on low-grade recyclables, low global energy prices making substitution of virgin material with recycled material less financially attractive, and the high costs of recycling for some waste streams. Despite these difficulties, councils are working to meet the European Union Waste Framework Directive target of a recycling rate of waste from households of at least 50% by 2020, and doing so with a much greater focus on improving the quality of recyclates so these materials can be used closer to home, creating jobs and additional value for the local economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer, uh, but uh, modern user-friendly layouts in terms of recycling centres encouraging citizens, encourages citizens to recycle a wide range of material. And in terms of this, would the Minister uh, acknowledge that uh, in Carrick Ferguson in particular, where there's lower recycling, that there's an urgent need to upgrade the local recycling facility? And can he advise what help and support and grants are available to encourage local government to upgrade their facilities to modern user-friendly facilities, which will encourage people to recycle? I thank Mr Beggs for the question and supplementary. I certainly concur with the member's view that the easier it is to do something, the more attractive it is to do and the more people uh, will do it. And that certainly is borne out if we look at investment that has been made over the past or last number of, of years in recycling infrastructure through uh, supporting councils in creating better and more attractive amenity sites for their recycling. Since May 2010, my department has allocated over £12.5 million pounds in capital funding and over £1.6 million pounds in revenue uh, funding through the Rethink Waste programme. And much of that funding has helped to deliver the current recycling rates of over 41%. And whilst there has been a slowdown in recycling rate increases in recent years, as most of the curbside services for the main waste streams have already been rolled out, many of the Rethink Waste initiatives and projects will take further time to come to fruition and these will contribute to ensuring that we meet the European recycling target of 50% by uh, 2020. Obviously, the, the member will have heard me lament uh, the current financial situation for my department and all, all departments uh, currently. So what we can do in terms of rethink waste grants has been impacted upon by the, the, the swinging cuts that came with the final budget settlement. However, there is capital funding still available, uh, and, and I'm happy to work with Carrick Fergus or wherever in terms of, of applications that they might make for grants available. Commissioner Oliver McMullen. Can I thank the Minister for the uh, presentation? But can the Minister outline the possible impacts the new councils, uh, since their amalgamation, may face uh, in reaching their waste management targets? Or am I good? Uh, I would uh, thank Mr McMullen uh, for that question. It's a question not dissimilar to one that, that has been asked uh, previously. 
in this House in response to which I spelled out the inevitable teething problems, if you like, of our different organisations, different councils, with different waste collection policies and programmes uh, co coming together and trying to find what methods best suit the council area as a whole. While I would very much like to see some degree of uniformity across all the councils, it's understandable that what works in an urban area in a city might not necessarily work in a more uh, rural area. So it's important that councils do retain that flexibility to identify what works best for them and what works best uh, for the environment. It's, we're now three months into uh, the, the new council structure and set up, and I do believe that all of the councils now should have overcome those teeth and problems, and I think that will be, although the up-to-date figures aren't available yet, that will be borne out in the coming quarters in terms of the amount of waste collected and, more importantly, the amount of waste being sent for recycling. And can I call uh, Ms Claire Hanna and welcome her to her first question time and first question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister about his thoughts on the glass bottle deposit return scheme being trialled in Scotland and any plans to uh, introduce a similar pilot here? Uh, and I very much thank Ms Hanna for that supplementary question. I very much welcome Ms Hanna uh, to these benches to know I to, to which I know she will bring much uh, sense and plenty of passion as well. I welcome the findings of the feasibility study for a deposit return scheme for Scotland recently published by Zero Waste Scotland. The study was informed by a number of recycle and reward pilot projects undertaken at locations across Scotland during 2013, and the pilots clearly demonstrated that incentivised recycling of drinks containers can be made to work and that the materials collected by the schemes were typically of very high quality. I believe that the deposit return system for drinks containers could play an extremely important and extremely effective role in reducing litter and improving recycling services and in supporting my ambition to develop and promote a low carbon circular economy here. Since I, I floated this idea, if you like, on Friday, I have to say I've been overwhelmed by the positivity of responses received, received to date uh, by, by the general public. Uh, far be it a, not from a, a novel idea, it's almost a nostalgic one, as many people within this chamber, perhaps not the member in question, will recall uh, deposit return schemes existing for uh, drinks containers in our childhood. But again, it's something that, that I will be pursuing. I've asked my officials to prepare papers outlining the feasibility and the desirability of such a scheme for here in Northern Ireland. And call Mr. Trevor Clark. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, following on from your answer to uh, the member, uh, Mr. McMullen, you talked about the difficulties in terms of local issues. Is it not time, then, Minister, that your department drove towards a single waste authority in Northern Ireland and actually brought all the waste together, as opposed to three separate organisations doing the same job? I, I thank uh, the, the member for that question, and f I suppose, in what's a, a rarity. I would actually concur with what the member is suggesting, and, and again, it's something that I have that I have spoken of on the floor here before. Ultimately, this will be a decision for local government as well, but it's one that my department will work closely uh, with them on. I personally <coughs> believe that the single waste authority is the best way forward, and I'm happy to talk with and negotiate with uh, local government to find the best way forward. Mr. Ian Mill. Question number two. The member will already be aware of my department's formal response to the Environment Committee's inquiry into wind energy. I welcome the committee's report as the product of an extensive and thorough inquiry process, and I believe it makes a valuable contribution to the debate surrounding wind energy development. As the member will know, I have sought to take account of the report's recommendations in finalising my department's strategic planning policy statement, or SPPS, which I will publish as soon as possible, following consideration by the Executive Committee. 
Other recommendations are being taken forward through guidance notes on the processing of wind energy development that my department is currently preparing. Work on this guidance is at an advanced stage, and I can confirm that it will address matters such as cumulative impact, noise impacts, and planning conditions. Furthermore, I have already made clear my intention to undertake a fundamental review of strategic planning policy for renewable energy following publication of the SPPS. Some of the report recommendations, including those regarding the use of the HCR97 noise assessment methodology and the minimum separation distance between turbines and dwellings, require further research, policy development and public consultation and are better considered as part of this fundamental review. Some other recommendations, such as those relating to consent process for connection to the grid, models of community energy ownership, or the report into the turbine failure at Scraga, fall outside of the remit of DOE and will require consideration and action by other departments and bodies. Nevertheless, my department is continuing to liaise with the responsible authorities in the supporting role to ensure that, where possible, these recommendations can also be advanced. I'm going to call Mr. Moon for a supplement. Mr. Moon, I was a Moon, I was a Moon, I was a I a a I thank Mr. Milne for that uh, question and a uh, supplementary question. Uh, cumulative impact is something that is taken into consideration, or at least certainly should be taken into consideration in the assessment of any renewable energy application, but in particular to date wind applications. Unfortunately, as the member touches on in his supplementary, there is no set criteria as to what that cumulative impact or threshold should be at. However, that's something that I do wish to, as outlined in my initial answer, address through the fundamental review of PPS 18, the policy that pertains to renewable energy applications. The term uh, saturation point is one that I have heard particularly in some areas in the north here, I think particularly in the, in, in the West Tyrone area, which is, has proven extremely attractive to wind energy uh, companies. That's why, in many respects, I, I, I think councils will welcome the fact that they will now be making decisions on the vast majority of these applications. Indeed, any application under 50 megawatts will be dealt with uh, locally, and uh, I think they are best placed to make these decisions. They will know what will work in their community, they will know what will be acceptable in their community, and if not, their community will certainly let them know. This is 50. And I call Ms. Katrina Ruyan. Deborah Three, let the hall. I'm sorry, question number three. The Planning Act, Northern Ireland 2011, supported by subordinate planning legislation, established a two-tier planning system on 1 April 2015, which gave the 11 new councils powers in relation to the functions of development planning, development management and planning enforcement. The 2011 Act places a statutory duty for the preparation of a local development plan, or LDP, upon the new councils, with the department having an oversight role, whereas prior to 1 April, the development planning function was exercised by my department. One of the key elements of the reforms to the planning system is enhanced early public engagement, including through the development plan process. The 2011 Act places a statutory duty upon the Council to prepare a Statement of Community Involvement, or SCI. This is a statement of a Council's policy to involve members of the public who appear to the Council to have an interest in matters relating to the development in its district. With respect to a local development plan, it is therefore the responsibility of each council to prepare a statement of community involvement and to consult with communities on their new local development plan in order to involve them in shaping the growth and development of their areas. In order to support councils in their new development planning functions, 
My department has developed a series of practice notes, one of which provides guidance on the preparation of a statement of community involvement and is publicly available on the planning portal. It is hoped that this practice note will be of particular assistance to councils undertaking consultation with communities on their new local development plans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his uh, answer. Will communities be able to secure local policy flexibilities uh, aimed at reflecting local and particular circumstances where appropriate um, when devising their LDPs? Uh, I thank Ms. Ryan uh, for that question. It's very much my intention that flexibilities will be able uh, to be secured by local councils for local communities. And again, that's something I uh, I alluded to in my earlier answer to uh, Mr Milne about how well placed councils are to know what their communities require, what will work in their communities and what will work for uh, their communities. Obviously DOE will retain uh, oversight and responsibility in terms of policy. However, I am determined that within that framework flexibility does exist for uh, councils to do not just as they choose uh, willy-nilly, but that within reason uh, they can work within that framework to deliver for their communities in a sustainable fashion on the ground. Gail, comes to Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Could I ask the Minister to detail the reasons why the Government departments are not being named as statutory uh, community development uh, partners? Uh, I thank the, the member for his, his question, and, and in my view, there is a very close linkage between community planning and the local development plan, which in many respects will be the special expression of that community plan. The consultation responses on the draft local government community planning partners order indicated a desire on behalf of local government and others to see departments named as statutory partners. Uh, on their community planning partnerships. I therefore sought the views of my executive colleagues on including the 12 departments as statutory community planning partners. And whilst their responses indicated support for the community planning process, most ministers do not believe that it is necessary or productive, I might add, for their departments to be named as statutory community planning partners, preferring, where appropriate, that their arm's length bodies many of which are named as statutory community planning partners, but that they participate in uh, the, the partnership. I think it is vitally important that we have as many departments and or through their arms length bodies buying into the community planning process if it is to be the success that we need it to be and that we anticipate uh, that it can be. I think we have to look at other processes that are still running, however, with mixed measures of success and I think of neighbourhood renewal as one and maybe a recalcitrance on behalf of some departments and agencies to buy into that, which in my opinion have not allowed it to realise its full potential. And I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I agree with the Minister Sonny. I know I had bitter experience being involved with the neighbourhood renewal with the departments not having enough buy-in. The minister has said that Europe, uh, he is going to establish an engagement protocol with the departments. Can he detail a bit more about how that may help more buy-in? Uh, and I thank uh, Ms. Lowe and I hope she's recovered from the better experience she uh, experienced in, in, in the neighbourhood. Uh, renewal. She is quite correct in, in identifying that I am currently consulting with executive colleagues on the development of a community planning engagement protocol. And the responses that I have received to date on this have been entirely positive. In addition, uh, members should be aware that I have established the Partnership Panel for Northern Ireland, uh, members of, membership of which comprises a uh, representative from each of the 11 new councils, executive ministers, and uh, representatives also uh, from NILGA. 
That partnership panel provides a mechanism for discussion between executive ministers and local government elected members on strategic policy matters at an, a, a political level. And while we've only had four meetings to, to date, I'd like to think that it is taking shape and, and will be a very useful tool in the future. Sandra Overend. Mr Speaker, I wonder if just can ask the Minister if he has any concerns about uh, councils adjacent to one another uh, adopting conflicting uh, policies in regard to the, the plans. Uh, I can call you, I think, uh, Ms Overend uh, for that question. Yes, uh, that's a, a very valid question and, and a very valid concern. It would seem ridiculous that one council would zone housing right up to the border of their council area, which would then be immediately adjacent to a piece of land zoned as, as open space, or uh, the, the, uh, development was to be prohibited on by the, the, their neighbouring council. That's why it is important that there is a central oversight re re retained by the DOE, and we'll be doing everything we can to actually encourage liaison between councils as well. I think it's very, that's very important. And it wouldn't just be on a council by council basis, but also naturally for uh, councils in, in border areas uh, to lay A's with their uh, neighbouring councils uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland as well. I call Mr. Peter Weir. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. In the past, I have highlighted the very serious implications of the budget settlement for my department, particularly emphasising the implications for a wide range of grant and other programmes aimed at supporting key environmental programmes. I further stressed that these cuts would have immediate and significant implications, including the loss of jobs for a range of voluntary bodies across the North. Since then, I have focused on doing whatever I can within the imposition of this extremely difficult budget to ease the impact of these cuts, primarily through the use of carrier bag levy receipts Therefore, I agreed initial allocations to environmental organisations totalling just under £1.5 million to help deliver a wide range of environmental outcomes. Furthermore, my department set up a workshop on the 23rd of April to discuss how best to allocate £1.25 million of residual funding from carrier bag levy income to support key environmental priorities and to help in safeguarding some of our most valuable sites and landscape protecting our priority species and encouraging access to the countryside. Following the workshop, which was attended by 22 ENGOs, the Natural Environment Fund opened for applications on 1 May with a closing date of 20 May. All applicants to this NEF were informed of the outcome of their grant application on 18 June in line with the established timetable. 21 NGOs and landscape management bodies were awarded funding. I have also allocated £0.3 million for the 2014-15 Challenge Fund from the Carrier Bag Levy, which will provide monies to support community groups and schools in delivering environmental projects. ENGOs, provided they are not the lead applicant, are encouraged to partner with eligible organisations in project delivery. The competition closed at noon on the 26th of June for community groups and will close at noon on the 25th of September for schools. I call Mr. Peter Weir for supplement. Mr. for his response, and albeit somewhat belatedly, at least there's been some progress in this front. Can I ask the minister then how many groups, uh, as a result of this, did not receive funding, and how many potentially are facing um, sort of removal of their activities as a result of that? Uh, I, I thank uh, the member for his question and for his begrudging recognition of my, albeit belated. Uh, intervention in this regard and the efforts to, to ensure that the amount of groups and the amount of that groups that were going to lose out on funding by was kept uh, to a minimum. As regards who is no longer eligible for funding or who hasn't been successful w w with the NEF, I do not have that uh, detail to hand. However, I will certainly provide it to the member, but I can assure the member that if he hasn't <laughs> seen it, on the TV or heard it in the radio, and I haven't heard any uh, particular criticism of the process that I engaged in, perhaps maybe with the regret that it was a wee bit late and it would have been, we'd love to have been in a position to carry this out prior to uh, 
the budget and, and this financial year, uh, the, the, the vast, vast, vast majority of groups, I'd say in the region of 99%, recognise the efforts that, that I have made in, in this regard. Thank you. And I call Mr Jim Wells. Which, uh, I'm sure the voluntary groups, of which I'm probably a member of every one of them, uh, are, are very uh, happy with progress so far. Does he not accept from me that this is a very ad hoc arrangement in the sense that the previous funding was guaranteed for up to a three year period. Organisations knew where they stood. Under his particular new scheme, they will be constantly having to apply with no guarantee that, that funding will continue. I am uh, able to thank Mr. Wales for that question, although why he would want to be a member of any group that would have him as a member, <laughs> I, 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 I do not know. I do agree that this has been a very ad hoc arrangement. However, the member will, or, or should recall, he, he was an executive minister at the time when we had to decide on a one-year budget. It was ex extremely ad hoc circumstances all around. I think I, I, I will have gone on record publicly again and again and again today that I wasn't particularly pleased with the hand that was dealt uh, to me at that budget. However, I think I have played that hand as well as I could. And I, I, I think uh, while the stakes were very high for uh, all these groups, that I have taken the gamble and got a big one for them. And I call Mr. Cahill O'Hush. Can I ask the Minister, does he think that these uh, budget cuts to the environmental NGOs will have a negative impact on these organisations in applying for European funding? Can I thank Mr O'Hashin for that question. As part of, of the National Environment Fund that, that we set up uh, in terms of judging the performance of these ENGOs, because it's worth rem remembering we are here as the Department of Environment not to ensure the survival of uh, voluntary and community groups, but to ensure the survival, the protection, the promotion of our environment. All of these groups happen to be providing services uh, that, that do just that. But as part of the criteria, we looked at the ability of these groups to draw match funding from many other sources, including Europe, and that was weighed up uh, whenever we were looking at their applications, assessing their applications and ultimately allocating funding to them. It's important, particularly in these uh, straightened times, that we do look externally and maximise the drawdown of money from other sources. And I'm afraid that ends the, uh, the question for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And can I inform members that questions 7, 8 and 10 have been withdrawn within the appropriate time frame? I call Mr Trevor Clark. Much, uh, Mr Speaker, um, just following on from the vein of the first question and the oral questions, can the Minister give us an update in relation to the Hightown Quarry application of when he's likely to make a decision in, in relation to that for that one waste management group? Uh, I thank uh, Mr Clark for that question and, and he is quite right to, to establish the connection between things such as recycling figures and waste infrastructure or the lack of, of infrastructure here in, in the north to uh, deal with our, our waste here in the, this region. As of, of yet the, the member will be aware there is an Article 31 planning application and it's currently been as assessed by my officials. I have not received uh, a report from my officials on that application to date, nor have I any indication as to when that uh, report might arrive. It is a hugely, there's massive public interest in this application, as the member will well be aware. There's somewhere in the region of three and a half thousand ob objections to it, uh, objections or, or assessments are made in applications based on the quantity of injections, however, they're based on, on, on the quality of them. But this application, like any application, will be subject to the most uh, st stringent examination and scrutiny by uh, planning officials, by Northern Ireland Environment Agency officials, before it even reaches my desk, and then it will be up to me to make a decision on that. Please. Sorry. 
Can, can I thank the Minister for his answer? And I, I mean, I welcome his answer in terms of the scrutiny that each of those departments are given. And I'm sure, like myself, he'll welcome the fact that one, one council group or the, that group through the Arc 21 have come forward with a proposal to deal with the waste. But can I take it from the Minister then, whatever recommendation his officials do give him, that he will sign that off in concurrence with whatever the officials are recommending uh, in relation to that particular application? Uh, I thank Mr Clark uh, for his question. However, I'm not in the position to give any guarantee on something that, that, that I don't know that the con what the content of it w will be. One thing that I can give a guarantee of is that I will give careful consideration to all factors, as I do with all decisions that I make before making a decision. Thank you. And I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, Minister may be aware of the growing concerns of members of the public uh, to the safety of wind turbines on both wind farms and especially second-hand single wind turbines. Can the Minister therefore advise what consideration his department is giving to these concerns uh, during the course of uh, new applications? I thank Mr. Buchanan uh, for that question. I am extremely aware of many concerns and objections that uh, residents across the north and beyond have with uh, wind energy applications. Again, in response to Mr Milne's earlier uh, question, I, I, I did refer to many of those concerns. I also referred to the fact that the member's own constituency is one area that will be particularly uh, suppose well versed in these objections and concerns. With regards to fears around the safety, I assume that the member is referring to potential health impacts of wind turbines and wind farms. I can remind the member that the Public Health Agency is a consultee on these applications. Also, whenever objections are made, these objections must be addressed. They must be answered by my department, which they do in consultation with agencies such as the PHA, hopefully in, in most instances to allay the concerns and, 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 and fears of residents or if there is a, a genuine concern that is shared by the relevant statutory uh, agency or authority that, uh, that it can be addressed by the applicant. I thank the Minister for his response, and it appears that any safety checks is all during the consultation process. But whenever the, when, uh, during, during the application or whenever the application is approved or is being approved, what stipulation does the Department place on it for the regular safety checks of these one turbines um, uh, on, on a regular basis whenever the farm is already completed and up and running? I, I, I thank. Uh the member for that question. And again, in response to an earlier question in terms of the committee's uh, report on, on wind energy, I, I briefly alluded to the incident earlier this year or, or late last year with the wind turbine at, at Scraga and how it fell in a hopefully un unprecedented event here in the north. And this is something that sent shockwaves not just through the local community, but certainly through the community at large across the north and again beyond that, that this could happen and the potential impact of, of uh, such an occurrence should it happen in close proximity to houses. I, I, at the time when I answered questions on it uh, in this house, I stipulated that while my uh, department retains a, a authority over planning matters, we are not the relevant authority to, to run checks on the safety of uh, these structures when they're up. That's a, a job for the health and safety executive. The same way if we give planning permission to a house, the DOE can't be, can't be chasing around doing building control inspections. There are other agencies and other bodies out there who are, are charged with this work. It's important that we work with them to ensure that they're doing it so that we can give some peace of mind and security to uh, those out there with these perfectly understandable concerns. When customers change tyres, the company that changes the tyre takes a fee off them for the proper disposal of those tyres. Could he tell us what action his department takes 
to ensure that the records of companies of tires which they have taken off customers um, marry with the disposal of the records of the disposal of those tires. Again, this is a subject of which Mr. Wilson ne never uh, tires. My department is, is, is working ver very hard on bringing forward new uh, measures to tackle the scourge of used tyres and the scourge of used tyres being illegally uh, dis to disposed of. Uh, I, I know as, as a previous Minister uh, of the Environment that Mr Wilson will recognise the, the complexity of this area of work and the, 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 the complications that exist in trying to grasp this issue and, and, and deal with it in a conclusive manner. I can, however, assure Mr Wilson that uh, we are working closely with uh, tyre manufacturers actually at the moment to discuss a best way forward in this. We are working closely with councils, uh, which is timely, I suppose, in the regard to today that we are close to bonfire season, where we see where many uh, tyres that are illegally and wrongly disposed of ending up uh, causing uh, huge environmental damage as well as a, a, a huge antisocial scourge uh, which tortures communities across the north. Mr. Wilson, for a supplementary. I'm not too sure that the Minister has given any answer to that question. Surely, if there's a record of the tyres which have been taken off, there's, there should also be a record of how those tyres have been disposed of. Given the fact that at around this time of the year, tens of thousands of tyres are being dumped by companies who presumably took money from customers onto bonfires, why can his agency not simply call with tyre companies, check what tyres have been changed, ask where they've been disposed of, and if no reasonable explanation can be given, why can't they be prosecuted for dumping tyres on bonfires? Uh, I, I thank the, the member for that supplementary scheme. And, and as I tried to outline in my initial answer, uh, my, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency and other areas within my department are working hard on coming up with a producer responsibility a scheme for tyres. We are working with other agencies on that. We are actually working with other jurisdictions on that. I think we have to look south as much as I know the member loves to, to see how uh, such a scheme has been rolled out in the Republic of, of Ireland. As I said in the answer to Mr Wilson's initial question, this is a very complex issue and it's one that I thought he would have some appreciation of the complexity of, given that he is a previous Minister for the Environment. However, clearly he, he does not, and that would indicate to me that when he was Minister, he did not uh, grasp this issue and take control of it, and uh, that is something I could probably continue with him outside. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, um, could I ask the Minister what preparatory work is being carried out uh, for the review of functions transferring to local government? Uh, those powers have transferred. It was built in that there would be a review and potentially further powers transferred to it. What preparatory work is he as Minister taking forward? I thank Mr. Uh, Given for that, that question. I, I referred again in response uh, to an, an earlier question around the establishment of the, the partnership panel, a panel which comprises of executive ministers and representatives from each of the 11 new councils. I think that panel is a very useful tool. It gives ministers, not just this minister, an opportunity uh, to hear the concerns of local government, should I say, but not just the concerns. It, it gives us also an opportunity to discuss the opportunities that, that, that do exist around the, the transfer of functions, those functions that have already been transferred and those that might potentially transfer in, in, in the future. With regard to a review, this is something that I think should be looked at and will be looked at commencing within a year of a vesting day, so, so, so that will be from April next year. And I, but, however, I think it is something that we need to do in partnership, very close partnership with local government, because the, the member may hear it from his own colleagues in local government, but there is quite a bit of disquiet and discontent out there around uh, some of the functions that they have received, or well, the budgets <laughs> to go with the functions uh, that, that they have received. And some out there in local government have the perception or, or idea, albeit maybe misplaced, that uh, the transfer of functions has been used as 
I don't know, can I use the term in here without offending the member, a Trojan horse <laughs> for a central government to pass cuts on to local government to make? Are any comments are given for a supplement? Well, I, I welcome the Minister's uh, commentary around the partnership process. Two functions that uh, certainly colleagues in Lisburn Council and Castle Ray that have expressed to me uh, that they would want to be looking at is on-street car parking, because obviously off-street is within their remit now, uh, but particularly uh, issues around the maintenance of grass verges has came to the fore, uh, and that is a function that I believe local government uh, could be delivering. Um, will the Minister lead on that in terms of trying to see what efforts could be made for local authorities working with, uh, obviously I appreciate it's DRD, to take forward some kind of approach whereby grass verges, a basic function of government, can be delivered, uh, where currently it's not. I thank Mr Given uh, for that supplementary. He quite rightly identifies that the function, or both functions to, to which he refers, don't fall within my department. Therefore, I cannot lead in the transfer of those functions. However, I can lead. I do lead and will continue to lead in the, the partnership and, and, and sort of convening the partnership between central and local government and facilitating those conversations that have to take place. Like I said earlier, I'm not sure that there will be a tremendous appetite out there right at this moment in time across local government for them to assume new functions in the immediate future. However, that's something I'm happy to talk to them, listen to them and work with them on. Uh, time is up, I'm afraid. So uh, if the House just takes its ease, why do we change the top table?